Thank you. Right. So welcome everyone to this extraordinary meeting of the Subject Overview and Scrutiny Committee 2, which is being convened as a hybrid meeting. The meeting has been recorded and will be available via the Council's website to be viewed subsequently. Everyone participating participating in the meeting will be accessing it either from the council chamber, civic offices, Angel Street, Bridge End, or from remote locations. Should I as the chair experience any technical difficulties during the meeting, Councillor Alan Watham will step in and take over temporarily as chair in my absence. And in his absence, it does say that Ross Penhill Thomas, Councillor Ross Penhill Thomas will step in. I'm not sure if we've got him on the meeting, have we? Yes, I believe so. Um, please can everyone ensure that the mobile phones are switched off or switched to silent mode, please. And members will have received an electronic copy of the agenda and I will ask officers to present a brief summary of the key points. For the record, the agenda can be viewed on the Council's website. Officers and members are reminded to refer to the page numbers contained in the public version of the pack, um, agenda report pack. Members and officers will be speaking at various points during the meeting and those speaking may switch their microphones on at that point. But I would ask that with the exception of myself as chair, all of the times to keep your microphones switched off as this will help to minimise any background noise and interference. However, I would invite members and officers to leave their cameras on for the duration of the meeting as agreed at the recent full council meeting. Whether attending the chamber remotely or no, sorry, whether attending in the chamber or remotely, my apologies, if any members and officers wish to raise a point or question, they should click the raised hand icon at the top right hand side of the Microsoft Teams window. And I will come to you in order that I receive the requests. If you are in the chamber, please switch on the microphone on your desk and speak directly into the mic to allow those who are remote to hear you clearly. Please lower your hand once you have finished speaking. The instant messaging chat button has been disabled for this meeting. Please do not use your microphone until I invite you to do so. Officers from scrutiny will be supporting the meeting and will be monitoring the use of the microphones throughout its duration and where necessary will mute those that are not being used. I will ask officers to introduce themselves when I invite them to speak during the course of the meeting and they too should ensure the microphones are switched off when not in use. So with that, I will now proceed to the agenda. So item number one, apologies for absence. I will now ask the scrutiny officer to announce apologies for absence as received, please. Thank you, Chair. I've received apologies for absence from Councillor Dave Harrison, Councillor Ross Penhill Thomas and Councillor Paula Ford, um, who, who has indicated that if we are still um, in the meeting at five o'clock, should be able to join us then. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, item number two, declarations of interest. If any member has an interest to declare in any matter on the agenda, please click on the raised hand icon and I will come to you in turn for your declaration of interest. No declarations? Lovely. Moving on. Item three, annual corporate safeguarding report 2022-23. I'll ask the officer to briefly introduce the report I will then call upon members who indicate they wish to speak by clicking on the raised hand icon in turn. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm Claire Marchant, Corporate Director of Social Services and Wellbeing, and it's my pleasure this afternoon to present um, for scrutiny consideration the annual Corporate Safeguarding Report. Th this report covers um, a reporting period from um, October 2022 through to the end of September 2023. So because you received lots and lots of other annual reports through scrutiny, um, we determined and, and brought last year a report that covered that period um, and thought it would be sensible. And I think committee agreed to, to continue to, to report on, on that period of time for, for the preceding year. This is the corporate safeguarding annual report. So it covers all parts of the council um, and the work that's done to safeguard um, children and adults at risk. Um, and so we've got colleagues here this afternoon from across all parts of the council. Um, so to my left, we've got Rayanna Granger, who's the um, group manager for safeguarding in children's social care. Um, we've got Jackie Davis, head of adult social care. Louise Morgan, who's the interim um, service manager for adult safeguarding. And then online, um, we've got Martin Morgans, um, who's head of partnership. So any questions pertaining 
um, to community safety, Voucher SV, uh, Violence Against Women, um, Domestic Abuse and Sexual Violence. Um, Martin will pick up the answer um, to those questions. We've also got Gail Biggs from Education and Family Support. So obviously the report covers education and safeguarding as well, and, and Gail will pick up the, those questions. So very much a, a, a whole council approach to safeguarding um, our, our children and adults at risk. We've got a corporate safeguarding group, which I chair as the statutory officer for, for safeguarding. And that group has really developed, I would say, over the, the last year, bringing together officers from, from across the council, looking at data um, from across the council, um, and developing, um, you know, a, a whole council approach to those, those safeguarding risks that, that we face as a county borough and trying to ensure that we've got, got that join up. Um, through that group, we look at data um, in, in quite a lot of detail. We report that um, through a, a corporate safeguarding dashboard up to um, Cabinet Corporate Management Board on, on a monthly basis. And that's important. And a couple of features of that has, has been, you know, the continued um, what we call exponential increase in, in contacts and demand into to children's social care. And obviously, we had the recent JICPA report, which you, you, you scrutinised at, at the last um, meeting, which talked about that, that impact and, and the partnership elements of that. In adult social care, we've um, also seen an increase in, in safeguarding referrals. Um, but amidst all of that, I, I would like to pay tribute to, to colleagues who ensure that we respond in both adults and children's services in, in a very timely way um, to those um, safeguarding contacts. And hopefully, as you can see from the report, in a proportionate way, um, which makes sure we progress safeguarding investigations where they are required, but make sure there's the appropriate alternative response if that's what, what we, we need to do. Just to highlight a few other areas of the report, I would say, you know, you can see that there's been significant improvements in our performance around direct deprivation of liberty safeguards in, in the last period. Um, we've seen, you know, that steady and safe reduction of the number of children on, on the child protection register, although the number of um, children and families who have statutory interventions from children's social care into their lives in, in, in Bridgend remains high. We pick up through this annual report that the links with um, our Comtaf McGannock Regional Safeguarding Board, which, which leads safeguarding across our region, and embedded within the report, you can see the, the Safeguarding Board annual report um, and annual plan for, for this year. One of the most important statutory functions of the board is the commissioning of adult and child protection um, and, and child um, practice reviews, sorry. Um, and you can see detailed there the number that have commenced and ongoing for, for Bridgend um, citizens um, and how we really use that learning through those reviews to, to embed improvements in, in our practice. Um, in, in terms of um, working at a local level, there's been really good um, progress over the last year, particularly around exploitation. This was an area of significant improvement for us, but, um, you know, really making good progress there through the development of a panel, which has been very well supported by partners um, to make sure that we have that right approach to, to intervene um, early in the lives of, of um, children, young people who are at risk of exploitation or being exploited. You know, it, one of our, our real positives as a local authority is um, the way that um, safeguarding is prioritised by, by colleagues in education and across schools. Um, Gail's t current team, I think, that the education engagement team um, is absolutely key in that, was very well um, recognised within the JICPA report. And you can see details within the report about their education safeguarding activity. Um, another real positive for us in Bridgend is that join up between safeguarding um, and the, the domestic abuse processes within um, our multi-agency safeguarding hub. Um, our D ASIA D domestic abuse service is, is really embedded now, and you can see updates within in the report around that as well, as well as the updates on, on the wider work of, um, of the Community Safety Partnership. Just then finally, um, within the report, you know, a significant pressure area for, for us in Bridgend, two significant pressure areas are highlighted. One is around housing and homelessness and, and the numbers of um, people within temporary accommodation. A number of those will be families with, with children. Um, many of the adults will be vulnerable. So, so those links and those strengthened links between housing and, and, and safeguarding have, have really come on in the last year. And, and the final sort of safeguarding risk really for us, which is, is highlighted, are the number of um, operating without registration scenarios 
where we can't secure um, registered accommodation, care and support for, for care experienced children and young people. And at any time we are, we're operating a small number, but high risk um, number of those placements. So that, that's a brief introduction, Chair, and myself and colleagues will obviously take, take questions throughout. Thank you. Can I bring you in, Councillor Gebby? You can indeed. Thank you very much, Chair. And firstly, apologies to the committee that I couldn't attend last time. Um, I do appreciate why, but I thought it was uh, more important that I be at a finance seminar. Um, as always, my thanks go to Claire and the team because of their hard work and dedication to our directorate, essentially. Um, I do believe that we need to approach council budgets differently, so I appreciate that's not the topic of this report today. But when we're in scrutiny or BREP with council, we need to look at a safe, through a safeguarding lens when we're assessing those budget recommendations. It must always be a priority. And as you can see throughout the report, we are making improvement in various areas in children's and adult services as evidenced. And while this report doesn't focus on finance, I do believe we need to focus on need, resource already in place, and the finance as a, as a third factor. And I would ask members to focus in this way when we're evaluating council budgets in the future so that we can continue on this improvement journey because it is an improvement journey and we've still got a considerable way to go. I think that's really well acknowledged, but we're doing significant work in that regard and we are making strides. Thanks very much, Chair. Thank you. Um, before we start, I, I'd like to just note that obviously there has been an awful lot of work gone into this and I, I am very grateful as well because this is a, uh, an extraordinary meeting that we've squeezed in. So I am very grateful for that as well because I know that's uh, um, been quite difficult. So thank you very much for that. Um, one of the things that we have noted throughout the report that I just wanted to raise before we go through the report is um, I know that we've switched from um, going from April to April on the reporting to um, October to September, so basically a year, but we switched where we are. It is still that sort of 12 month period. But one of the things that we have noted throughout the report is that we've got a lot of tables here with a lot of data in it, but there's no comparison data in there. So we're we're not able to see the full picture. We, we have gone away and we have pulled out the uh, comparison data from last year. So, we, you know, we have run through that in the uh, um, rehearsal there in the pre-meeting. So um, members are aware of the, the figures, um, but it would have been helpful, I think, um, and certainly in future, if we can do that, that would be really um, appreciated. So with that in mind, um, and I am minded as well, um, Councillor Gerby, with what you've said about budgets, because there are quite a few questions coming up about budgets and sustainability, etc. So um, we will be looking at that as well. Um, but yes, with that in mind, I will take our members through to the uh, um, questions that they have. And I believe our first one is, unless anybody else has one, is um, on page eight with uh, Councillor Joanna Llewellyn Hopkins, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. I just wanted, I just wanted to, know to know what know. the thresholds for adult protection are. They mentioned on page eight. And what is being done basically to ensure that nobody is missed? Thank you. Do you want to come in? Yeah. Oop, sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Louise Morgan. I'm the Interim Adult um, Safeguarding Service Manager in Pregend. Um, an adult at risk is a person um, that would need care and support needs and would not be able to report things for themselves. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, what we do, we ensure that there are processes in place to ensure that, that these are considered when referrals are received and then a proportionate response is made then. So we also work with our um, other partners in the MASH. So that's our health colleagues, police, um, housing, etc. Um, to make sure that these are addressed in a in a timely manner. Fantastic. Does that answer your question, uh, Councillor Llewellyn Hopkins? It answers the first part, but oh. not really the second part of what's being done to ensure that nobody gets missed. Yeah. Thank you. Can I can I ask you to pull your microphone forward as well, just so that it, so it's right in front of you. So if you pull, sorry everyone. Yes, there you go. Just so it picks you up better. But um, if you press the red button and if, if you want to come back, oh, okay. Yeah, do, do you want me back. to pick that up? Yeah, yeah. thank so, you. So, so I think what, what the report picks up is that there's a high number of referrals into adult safeguarding 
but far lower number of, of um, individuals who go on to safeguarding strategy meetings and, and on for, for, for safeguarding investigations. Now, there'll be a number of reasons for that and to pr probably to provide assurance, um, really, that nobody is missed. So, so if a, a referral comes into adult safeguarding, and it's not really a safeguarding re referral, but more a referral for an assessment for care and support, that referral will, with consent, because consent is, is, is key within um, adult services, be passed to our common access point, and then that proportionate assessment continue, because sometimes somebody will be worried about, about somebody else. That will come in, but it's not really a safeguarding matter. It's more that, that they need that assessment for, for care and support. So just to provide that assurance, really. I don't know if you want to add, add to that, Louise. Uh, sorry, just like to add to that, that a lot of these cases don't progress to a strategy meeting, but they are dealt with under Section 126 inquiries, um, and, and a lot are dealt with and closed in that manner, but lots of inquiries are made and um, protection plans put in place to alleviate or try and mitigate as much risks as possible, really. Lovely, thank you. Does that, uh, does that satisfy you now? Yes, thank you. Thank you, I thought it might, thank you. So, um, Oh, sorry, Councillor Gabby. No, no, it's fine. Uh, and, and I suppose there's a, one other additional comment that I would make to that. We can have any referral come into social services through safeguarding, through, through our front door, essentially. If a person does not agree to have any of this and they have capacity, then there is nothing that we can do because they have capacity to make their own choices. And it doesn't matter whether that we think they're poor choices and we would all consider them to be poor choices in relation to their life. They have that choice to make those poor decisions. And I would always stress that because that's a very different set of circumstances for social mm -hmm. services than pre <laughs> the Social Services and Wellbeing Act. And I think that's really important to note. So social services mm. has had to do a complete switch around. You would always knock on the front door. We've yeah. had this raised with us. We want to deal with it. We are no longer able to work in that fashion. And quite rightly so, mm. because if somebody wants to live the way they want to live, that's entirely up to them. Thanks mm. very much, Chair. Thank you for that. I think that's a really important distinction to make, actually. So thank you. Um, moving on to page nine, um, Councillor Watham, I have you halfway down the page there. Yeah, thank you, Chair. My uh, question relates to Table 2, which uh, relates to the category of abuse recorded for adult at risk referrals between the 1st and 10th, 2022, and the 30th and 9th, 2023. I understand that uh, these figures have increased greatly in, from previous years, especially in relation to neglect and physical abuse. Do we know what the reasons are for these increase in these figures? And secondly, we've got a category not captured. What does that relate to in particular? Thank you. Who would like to take that? Hello there. Um, well, with regard to neglect, there has been an increase, but these can be for things, um, for example, like pressure related skin damage, and then they would be investigated. So these can happen several times in the care home, and we would ensure that the tissue viability nurse is involved and make sure that there's um, an appropriate plan in place. And with physical abuse, you're looking at a range of, it could be a, um, a patient with another patient on a mental health ward, um, could could physically assault another patient but they have dementia etc these things could happen in a care home or it could be again extreme violence like in for domestic violence and all these are looked at individually then on a case-by-case -case basis we are looking at doing a better analysis um going forward as well and quality assurance with um for the for the next quarter yeah, we've got somebody looking at uh, looking at the analysis of the. the I think there as well. Um, whilst it's uh, informative to know the reasons why these figures are here, it doesn't actually answer why they're up as well, because that's quite a significant jump. So last year, the neglect was 147, and that's gone up to 227, and we've got 148 last year, up to 224. So is there a reason behind the increase in these? Um, are you know? people with dementia being mixed with people who don't have dementia and is that causing an issue or is there, is there some sort of reasoning behind it? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
There's, there's no specific reason. Um, what we are seeing um, across the whole of adults is increases mm -hmm. in our front door, increases in the number of safeguarding referrals, and then consequently what we're seeing then is an increase in, in each of the categories. So there's an overall increase in the activity that's coming into adult social care, either through safeguarding or through just our, our normal contact centre, really. It is a, something that's happening nationally, and um, we, we looked at the national figures the other day, and it is something that's happening a, across the whole of Wales, really, the numbers of that we're, overall that we're managing through our processes. Claire? And, and, and just to, I suppose, build on what Louise was saying, one of the things that we're doing with the regional <laughs> guardian board is a piece of work um, to look at the thresholds. Um, for adult safeguarding to make sure that, that we're operating, I suppose, as consistently as possible across the region um, and, you know, to understand from that qualitative point of view what, what's driving these referrals. I think, as, as Louise was describing, really, you can see multiple referrals sometimes from the same setting or re relating to, to two individuals who might be living alongside each other in, in a care home or in, or in a hospital for, for a period of time. And then until that safety plan is, is put in place, that, that adult protection plan, which might mean that those two individuals aren't, aren't living together any longer, quite a high number might relate to, to, to um, specific individuals um, there. I think what, what Jackie's describing in terms of that increase of activity across the board um, then, then translates here, doesn't it, into referrals which come in via this route. But I think, as you can see from above, then only a far smaller proportion meet that threshold to go on to, to the safeguarding strategy and the, and, the, and the further investigation. So most of these are resolved at a, an early stage, which is, is, is positive in terms of, you know, them not being of such a serious nature that they require that, that ongoing investigation. Thank you. So I think that's the first part of your question there, Alan. Are you content with that? Yes, yeah, thank you for that, Chair. The, the, the further part of the question was uh, in the table, it says 14 categories not captured. Uh, what risk does that involve? What is, does that relate to? I, th I think there's a couple of things in that. Um, so what, when the forms come in, it hasn't been identified one single type of abuse yeah, um, in, in terms of that. So it's not recorded in the way that um, if somebody was being financially abused, it's not recorded in that way. It could be individuals that, that have got a number of categories yeah, um, in, in terms of that. And it could just be that the, the recording hasn't, hasn't picked up that where, it, where it should be. So, um, But just to reassure you, because the category says not captured there, we go through exactly the same process. So, you just, so there's, no, um, there's no detriment there for individuals. Are you content, Councillor Watson? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I think from my point of view, because all of these are up except for um, sexual, which is um, down by one uh, point there and um, obviously the category not captured when we look at the figures last year they're all up um, I'm just wondering if if that is what we discussed in JIGPA with the um, uh, the multi-agency working there if that, that's putting that pressure on that there's like you say more coming through that front door and that's where that pressure is coming from and how that would impact us budgetarily as well I, I, I think um, yeah, what, what, what we're seeing, you know, which is a positive, that there's increased awareness about how to um, how to report safeguarding concerns. That, that was the top priority for the regional safeguarding board in, in terms of the annual plan for, for this year. So a lot of, I suppose, campaigns, we've just had safeguarding week, haven't we, to, to make sure that communities and individuals as well as pro um, professionals know how to, to report safeguarding concerns. So that's positive. I think in adult services, uh, and Jackie might wish, wish to add, we're still seeing that the post-COVID impact of people who experienced delays in getting treatment during COVID, who, who you know um, didn't go out during the COVID period, and therefore that impacted on their mobility and and their um, their, their health at, from both a physical and and mental health perspective, and all of that drives this this demand, doesn't it, for for adult social care. And that translates into to referrals coming through. It obviously has a, as, as a budgetary implication um, because, you know, as an authority, we've always committed to, to responding um, in a timely way. That there, there's um, national performance indicators 
um, in terms of adult social care and, and the amount of time, seven days, for completing those, those, those screening inquiries. Um, and we have to resource to, to that level in order to meet those performance standards. Um, as you know, Chair, through the budget monitoring reports that, that you see, um, we are significantly overspent in, in adult social care. And that's being driven both by the volume and the complexity of the demand that, that's coming through into services. Thank you. Sorry, my mic was off. Lovely. Um, moving on then to page 10. And Councillor Eugene Kaparos, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, it, it says there at the uh, towards the bottom of the page. Hello. OK, uh, right. In 2023-24, um, we received a £133,000 grant, uh, which we used for agency staff to help clear uh, the 150 case backlog, um, leaving you with, with, with only 34. Can you advise what is the backlog like now? And is this a uh, problem solved or something we're going to have to continue uh, managing? Apologies, we're just um, we're just going to try and resolve this uh, IT issue. But if we continue here in the chamber, um, thank you. Did did everyone catch that question as well? Right, fabulous. Thank you. Who would like to take it? Sorry. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you, Chair. So in, in terms of the, the dolls situation, so we used part of the grants to employ the agencies to clear the backlog. Um, and at the time of this report, there were 34 cases that were left to be allocated, but that's subsequently reduced. And I think it was about 19, the last figures that, that I looked at myself. In terms of the dolls, it's a rolling programme and we've got systems in place now to, to be able to, to standardise that as, as we go through, through the periods, really. What we do find in um, the management of the dolls is that the, it, it does um, it does peak and then it and then it then it goes down. Um, particularly in COVID, where we had um, quite a lot of activity within our care home settings, um, that's where we, that's where the backlog sort of came from, really. Um, we are confident going forward that we'll be able to sustain um, to, stay, to, to sustain the levels that we've that we've got now. So. Thank you. Um, does that satisfy your question, Councillor Kaparas? Yes, thank you very much. Lovely, thank you. Um, moving forward to page 11, and I have Councillor Llewellyn Hopkins at the top of the page, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Two seconds, please. Um, basically, my question is, are we dealing with the deprivation of liberty orders in the correct and legal manner, as has been previously suggested? Thank you. So I've had my hand up to, to reference something uh, specifically because of my comments around budget and when we're looking at things through a safeguarding lens. When we're doing dolls, that has an awful impact. I say an awful impact, that's the wrong word to use. Um, but it has a massive impact on legal services. So the legal provision here in the council and the officers that have to provide that support. And I think that's also worth noting. So yes, in response to your question, Councillor Hopkins, yes, they are all managed legally and appropriately. We wouldn't get a dolls otherwise because they all go in front of a judge essentially. Okay, thanks very much. I think as well, um, sorry, Councillor Llewellyn Hopkins, uh, um, if you don't mind, I think um, it might actually be more a question around the fact that we have taken that advice from the barrister. Are we now following that advice going forward? That's the case, isn't it? Yep, thought so. Thank you. Are you content with that answer? Um, can I just ask a supplementary oh, question? It was on a later that. matter, but it does link in with this. It's on page 27. I know I've le left a bit ahead, but it is relevant to this. It's what's the difference between the dollars and a quarter protection order and what are the different financial implications of both, please? I thought it might be pertinent to ask that now while we're discussing dollars. Thank you. No, that, I agree. That's fine. Who would like to take that? Okay, so in, in its simplest form, because it's quite a, um, a detailed piece of legislation, the, the standard dolls authorizations are in care home settings or in a hospital setting. 
The other deprivations of liberties where um, we go through the court of protection is where people live with their own tenancies. So it's, it's where they live in predominantly for us um, learning disability people who live in supported housing, so we're the housings of multiple occupancy. So that's in the simplest form, the difference between the two. Sorry, yes, I was going to say there was a, a second part to that as well. Yeah, and, and, and in terms of the budgetary um, implications, so, so for those, those deprivation of liberty safeguards that are in regulated care settings with the authorising authorizing body as, as a local authority or the health board is if it's a health setting, for those which are court of protection, um, it has to go in, into the court and, and um, granted by a judge. That obviously is far more resource intensive from a, from a budgetary perspective. And we have been managing a budgetary pressure in this area. Our learning disabilities team has some um, additional over-establishment has some additional over-establishment um, workers within the team in order to make sure that we're um, working through all those cases which which require the court of protection authorization and, and the work is very detailed in that area so yes it is more resource intensive from from a budgetary perspective as well thank you does that answer the question there for you then fully yes thank you chair perfect lovely um moving on down to um the graph one on page 11 as well um, a question from myself. I, I've, I've obviously looked back over the previous figures, so we've kind of got an arch going here. So that figure where it raises in November, December, January, and then starts to tail off again, that's the top end of the arch there sort of thing. So I just wondered, and it, it could be quite um, a difficult question to answer this, so I, I apologise in advance. Um, do we have an anticipated levelling out figure I obviously don't want you to be Mystic Meg. I know you can't be, but I'm just wondering if we do have some sort of levelling out figure. And um, if so, is that a sustainable figure? And does it? how does it lay with our, our three year plan as well? Thank you. Hello, Rihanna Granger, Group Manager, IAA and Safeguarding. Can I ask which graph that you're referring to, please, Chair? I think my page numbers, I apologise, are different to yours. No worries. So I have got that graph there on the bottom of page 11. And I've that's got table it. number? Table, uh, table 6, graph 1. Lovely, thank you. Okay. I'm really putting Thank the you. pressure on you. Not only am I putting the pressure on for an answer. <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's, it's fine. No, no problem. So in terms of our child protection register, um, yeah, the, at the start of this year, it, it was the highest that it ever been. Mm -hmm. um, since that time, we've done some targeted uh, work. We've uh, been successful in our workforce um, becoming more stable, we've strengthened the process to ensure there's greater management oversight, we've undertaken QA work and dip sampling, um, we've introduced processes um, uh, such as consultations with social workers for cases where there's been some drift and we're really stuck yeah. and we're not sure what to do with. So all of those factors have resulted in the child protection register numbers coming down and coming down in a safe way, uh, coming down in a, in a steady, um, a steady reduction. It's always very difficult to predict what will happen. One thing I will say is, as you'll be aware, we've introduced our signs of safety practice model. Now, the, uh, there's a number of benefits to that model, but one of them is it makes uh, risk and planning much clearer and it makes it um, more straightforward to evidence positive change and when risk has been reduced. So what we are hoping to see, and we are doing some work streams around this, is what we call our meaningful measures, is to look at the impact of that uh, practice model. And one of the um, pieces of data that we'll be looking at is the amount of time that children spend on the child protection register. And we would hope to see a reduction in the months spent because everything's clearer and everybody's working in a more efficient uh, way. Um, so we are hoping uh, to see that and we will be monitoring that and undertaking uh, quality assurance work. Um, as I said, it is always difficult to, to predict, um, but we would also uh, like to see cases of re-registration, so cases where children are removed from the child protection register, but within one year come back. And that, that really indicates to us that our interventions haven't been successful, or not in the long term, obviously. So we'll be looking at that data set as well. 
Um, so, so work is ongoing. It's definitely uh, an area that we'll be paying close attention to. Um, I certainly would hope we wouldn't be returning to the figures of 300 plus on the Child Protection Register um, because of all those processes that I've talked about. Um, but I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't want to, to, to give a figure today that we would hope to see it come down to, but there's lots of work streams and, as I said, the signs of safety that should reduce those numbers further. Thank you for that. That's really heartening to hear and it's, it's good because you can actually see that this is coming down. That is exactly the direction we want to see it going in and it's obvious that the work that's been put in, and it is significant work, it's working. So congratulations, well done. That's, that's good news. Thank you. Um, moving on to... Oh, so, and my apologies. Sorry, it's Councillor right. Gebbie. Right. Can I just shout next time? Yes, please. Just please. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, I think it's also worth referencing, um, I know Ray just referenced signs of safety model. And I think one of the things that we need to note is the amount of referrals that were coming in through the front door, particularly in children's, and that's from partner agencies. And I think one of the, one of the, the biggest pieces of work that we think we've still got to do is with our partner agencies and having that understanding around risk and why we're using the model that we are. Um, and until we can get that more embedded into their processes as well it, it's slowing us down i would say significantly because we're dealing with more referrals that actually we shouldn't be dealing with under section 47 they should potentially go into early intervention and prevention so i think we, we are on the right track but we need our partners to sign up to this as well so obviously those conversations are being had with the partners um how long do you envisage that wheel to start turning on that as well claire thank you yeah, I, I think actually, too, it was quite heartening when um, we had partners here at the JICFA scrutiny, didn't we, that to hear that they've already signed up to signs of safety. I, I think um, Claire O'Keefe from the Health Board um, spoke on that um, at, at that scrutiny meeting. Um, we are, as part of signs of safety implementation, that there are partnership training days and an ongoing engagement which is happening. Um, and, you know, we've heard you know, just in, in recent extended management teams, good practice examples where we've had um, perhaps a health visitor, I think it was in the one that I'm thinking of, who had been very sceptical about signs of safety, but actually seeing the impact and the positive outcome for, for a child and, and family through working in that way has, has changed their mind. So I, I think that there's, there's various levels of it. One is, one is normative. By working in that way, they see different outcomes, better outcomes, and therefore they want to work in that way. The other is, is very, you know, you've got to be very systematic when you're implementing such a, a big programme of change as this, making sure that partners are a part of this at, at every every juncture. Probably our biggest barrier at the moment um, to signs of safety is, is the system we work on. And, and, and that's what practitioners are saying to us, um, because all this good work happens and then they come back and they, they have to record this on a on a system which isn't fit for purpose and takes them back into old ways of working. And at some point that will change as well. Um, but, but that's probably what, what our biggest barrier and risk is at the moment. Um, thank you. And just to add to that, we have, um, we've rolled out our signs of safety training to partner agencies and we've asked for partner agencies to identify champions, so within education and within health, so they can then go on to um, disseminate the, the training um, around signs of safety. We're working currently on an animation that will be sent out to families, children and partner agencies. And we've got a programme of surveys um, that's now in train to, to get uh, a baseline currently. And then obviously when we move through into, as we move through into the new year, we'll be um, further developing that to get feedback once more processes are worked compliant to signs of safety. So we'll be able to, to, to really bring some rich um, comparable um, information and data certainly to, to this next meeting. So. Fantastic. That that sounds positive and it sounds once um, our partners are on board and they are working in the same processes that we are in the same way, then that will start to speed up quite significantly as well, I think. So well done. Yeah, thank you. Um, page 12 to the top, um, I believe, Councillor Llewellyn Hopkin, you might have had a question there. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Hang on two seconds. Right, at the top of page 12, um, Appendix 1, there's quite a significant increase in neglect and physical abuse. 
Um, I want, just want to know, what is that attributed to, please? If anybody can suggest that, please. OK, thank you. Um, yes, I think in terms of neglect, um, we we know the pressures that are on our community currently, the housing uh, issues, the cost of living. All of these things has an impact in terms of children that are experiencing neglect. Um, the more pressure the families are under, the more exacerbated those neglect issues become. We've got, as I talked earlier, a more stable workforce, um, so a more permanent work workforce that um, undergo more training. So that it's that recognition of neglect also. Um, physical, obviously, it's not it's not new, but um, we've had our, our chastisement law change, so that has impacted on our response uh, to, to physical chastisement um, and physical injury. So. Um, it's those factors that um, increase those numbers. Thank you. Are you content with that? Yes, thank you. Lovely. Um, moving on down uh, page 12, I've got Councillor Eugene Kaparos, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, we can see on the, the table seven, the, the work of MASH and the IAA service um, has been uh, rising, the number of contacts again is rising quite considerably. Uh, just on one of the figures from from six thousand last year to ten thousand nine hundred and thirty six uh, this year. What impact is this having on the statutory time scales to deal with things, if any? And where, where you're saying you're meeting your targets, does that mean every single person is meeting your targets, or is there? Um, uh, a separate target overall, say like getting nine out of ten people past the, the statutory target. Uh, thank you. We've got um, uh, different targets for different elements of the work that we undertake. So um, as, as you've rightly pointed out, the demand on the service has increased hugely. Um, but I'm also pleased to report that our compliance figures have also uh, improved over the year. So we um, We've got a number of targets set by Welsh Government, um, so that would be um, for things such as making a decision on a referral within 24 hours. Um, so we're consistently 100% uh, in terms of that and have been so in this reporting uh, period um, in terms of our care and support assessments that we undertake. Um, we're up around 90% um, where the Welsh Government target is 88%. So there are certainly areas where we are exceeding um, expectations in terms of our child protection conferences um, for, for reviews were, were around 100%. Yeah, 99 point um, and, uh, you know, initial uh, looked after care experience reviews um, were up around 97 percent. So all higher than the um, target. There's always work to be done. I think um, our section 47 uh, inquiry, so that's our child protection investigations. Um, we're, we're doing work there to improve that figure. It's still very good in terms of our partner agents, uh, um, sorry, our, our regional partners. Um, but we would like to be up in the 90s there, and we're in we're, we're more down in the in the low 80s uh, in relation to that figure. So um, yeah, lots of work to be done. But very pleased to report, given the um, significant increase in demand, um, we've we've also increased our compliance and target figures. Are you are you content with that? Yes, thank you, oh. Chair. Very reassuring. I'm just going to bring Claire in as well. Apologies. Yeah, to, to, just to add to what, what Rayanna has said, um, and I suppose building on a theme for, from the deputy leader, the way that we've been able to achieve what, what has been quite remarkable performance is through significant investment um, from, from the council. Um, so, you know, we've significantly increased the, the workforce uh, in, in Ray, Ray's service, the, the um, front door, the MASH and IAA service. Um, we've brought in a managed team, as, as, as um, Scrutiny Committee um, knows, and without that, we wouldn't be able to meet this level of, of, of demand um, in a safe way. So, so we are now operating safely, and I think that, that, that that's really important, isn't it, in terms of safeguarding children in the county borough. The three-year sustainability plan, therefore, that, that, um, that Cabinet and Council approved back in September, is critical to moving us from 
a position where we're meeting this this exponential demand um, through a non-permanent resource, through through a resource which is above establishment, to try and to to get us on a sustainable footing, um, and to over a period of time safely reduce um, the number of statutory interventions. Now, something that's very hard to control is the demand coming in through the front door because we would never want to say to partners or to members of the public. Um, don't refer to us because we've got limited capacity. That is absolutely the opposite of the message that we're given. Our front door is always open. We need to know what we need to make sure is there's the right response when um, referrals do, do come through and that those circumstances which can be discharged through information advice and assistance or through um, another part of the system, you know, in, in terms of early help, picking up those, those sets of interventions rather than a safeguarding intervention, we need to make sure that that's all joined up at the front door. Um, but yeah, when, when demand has gone up by, by that level of significance, um, you know, it, it obviously has significant resource implications. Thank you. Um, does that further answer your question, Eugene? Uh, yes, thank you very that? much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, moving on, uh, page, apologies, page 13. I have Councillor Llewellyn Hopkins at the bottom there. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, on page 13, you talk about PLOs, so public law outlines. I'd like to know what steps are being taken, please, to stop the cases getting to this level. Thank you. Um, I, I can respond. So we've introduced case consultations now. So um, no case is put to a legal planning meeting without a case consultation first. And when that case consultation work is undertaken, a number of uh, factors are, are considered. Uh, obviously, what support uh, and interventions have already been tried and, and can we actually look at doing something differently? Um, we've introduced under signs of safety family network meetings. So this is um, putting the onus on families to identify their own solutions. Um, within their family and friendship uh, unit. So it's, it's that additional layer of checking that actually have we done everything that we could do to support this family and keep these children safe um, instead of being flippant to make a point rushing to a legal planning meeting um, when sometimes that you know, could be premature. Um, and I think that um, is certainly having an impact. And it's, it's impacting practitioners in just making them really think and front load cases because the, the public law outline is, is designed for us to front load cases. So when we go to court, we're, we're not in an assessment phase. We've done everything we can do and we're really clear on what our, our plan is and what needs to happen. So those consultations are really supporting um, lowering those numbers of cases that, that then enter proceedings. Thank you. Um, does that answer the question for you? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Lovely. Fantastic. So moving on to page 14. I don't know if we've got anything else on there. Page 15. Um, I just wanted to briefly ask myself um, on the child and adult, adult practice reviews. Um, Again, it might be a, a difficult question to ask because um, we can see that it says there in paragraph one, two, three, four, five, there are four child practice reviews being undertaken in relation to Bridge End children that will be published during the next reporting period. I know there's a couple of them still to come. Um, how is that going to affect us budgetarily again? Because obviously there's a, an impact with that, I believe. I can see you shaking your head, but uh, I'll, I'll come back to you. Um, but as well, are we seeing themes emerging as well from these um, reviews? Are we seeing themes that we're getting on top of, themes that are an issue for us, themes that are presenting problems? And what are those, please? Thank you. So I won't go into too many specifics, but from every case review, we have an outline of what needs to be addressed, what we what we need to do differently with all the plans that are already currently in, press, in place we're all actually exceeding what's being put on those plans. So is there going to be a budgetary impact? No, because all the work. And, and so I'll give you an example of one of those. Uh, one of the things that, Kate, that that's come out from a serious case review is the fact that we weren't recording adequately. So there's more oversight, there's more management oversight, there's better systems in place. There's more, me I want to say there's more meetings, but there's more discussions 
around why people are doing what they're doing. So no, very definitely no budgetary imp implications for us. Um, uh, and it's normal um, for these case reviews to come through in this manner. So, and you will get an update on them altogether probably from Claire and I, a future scrutiny meeting. Thank you. I mean, obviously they do have um, an impact there in um, resourcing and that's, you know, uh, an impact for us um, in terms of our budget and our resources and how we use that. So I don't know if that has an impact there. Um, I, wouldn't, I don't want to say negatively, but if it's putting a, a challenge there for us as well. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think in terms of child and adult practice reviews, they, they, they can impact on the t amount of time that, that it takes for, for colleagues um, to, who, who participate in those, those reviews. So um, whenever there's a re review which involves a Bridgend child, we, we have to nominate um, somebody who will be a member of that review panel who hasn't been directly involved in the case. There's a lot of work that goes into that in terms of, you know, detailed chronologies, we undertake our own sort of internal management review and, and try and ensure that any single agency improvements that we take in advance of the, the practice review, um, identifying its learning. Obviously, people have been involved in, in the individual case, participate in, um, in in the learning events. And, you know, then there's that ongoing sort of embedding of learning. I think I think in terms of what Councillor Gebby said, what we're trying to ensure is that where these themes are coming through from learning, there are implants that already exist. So as we know, the, the children's and families plan has got significant resource implications. We wouldn't at this point anticipate there's anything new that we haven't already identified that's in, in that plan. Um, but very, very open to, to that. And some, some, you know, on a positive note, as we heard with the JICPA, some of these solutions have been relatively low cost. So, so we yeah. know information sharing was an issue and, and that the GOS system has been developed, you know, almost sort of pro bono by a neighbouring authority. So th those sorts of things are more about how we work than, than significant additional resources. But, but it does take its toll on the workforce when these reviews are happening. It, it, it's you know, really important that we continue to invest in the support for, for people who do participate in, in the reviews. Lovely. Thank you very much for that explanation, because that was uh, um, very broad ranging as well. It does cover a lot there. So thank you. Um, moving on to page 16. And can I bring Councillor Llewellyn Hopkins back in, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, on page 16, it states between April and July, all social care workforce were offered and attended two-day signs of safety training. Does this mean that there was 100% of the staff uptook the training? And what's the uptake on mandatory training across the board, please? I, Councillor Swelling Hopkins, I, I would be a hostage to fortune if I said yes, 100% <laughs> attended. Um, I know it was very, very well attended. I don't have the exact figure here. I'm sure there may have been some colleagues who perhaps off on sick leave or maternity leave who, who may not have been in, in work. The, the next phase of this training has been five day training. Um, and again, you know, very, very well attended and, and you know, good evaluations as well in terms of the the, the impact of, of, of the training too. In, in terms of mandatory training across the board, I think ourselves and other directorates, we, we see the information. Um, I, I know so, some members would have seen it in the corporate performance assessment, where, for example, we don't have 100% within our directorate around the e-learning for safeguarding. Now, some of our explanation for that is that many of our colleagues who won't have done that are very highly trained in safeguarding because that's their day job. But nonetheless, there's a council-wide mandatory 100% safeguarding training, which we um, continue to, to ask our staff to prioritise alongside every everything else. So we're not 100% on all the mandatory training. I think that's explicable in, in, in the safeguarding sense. Um, and we'll get perhaps the exact figure on, on attendance on the signs of safety training for, for committee. Um, just to add, the um, the next cohort of the five day training is in January, and that's actually oversubscribed. So they're, now they're looking at putting in some additional um, days. I think as practitioners start to use the model, um, and they become more confident and they like it, everybody's booking on to that training. So there's mechanisms in place by the principal officer, um, Sarah Wynn, to um, to to know who's attended what, and there's a, there's sweep up sessions, so we will make sure that um, every, everybody attends that. But great to hear it's oversubscribed. Councillor Gebby. So I suppose one comment to note: I I, I noticed Claire's comment about that all our staff not doing the safeguarding mandatory training that's online, our e-learning. 
I would advise members that's the same standard of training that you've all undertaken. And if that's all my social workers have done, I wouldn't want them in the job at all, if I'm very frank and honest. So I think that's just to contextualise the information that you're receiving. I, I understand, but I think there's something about a review period of what's mandatory for who. I would expect all of us as members to do that safeguarding training and all officers outside of the directorate and including all the administrating staff, but not necessarily my social workers who I know have to do it at such a high level that I don't know why they'd be ticking boxes, if I'm honest. Thank you for that. Um, did you want to come back with a supplementary or are you content? No, that's fine. Thank you. No worries. Just um, as a matter because you've raised that, obviously, um, then we've got staff who are taking time out, who have to undertake a training that is, I don't want to say beneath what their level is, but obviously that is a very baseline level and they are far and away above that. And rightly, we would expect that. Is that an issue? Is that becoming an issue? Should should that be addressed elsewhere? Is that something we should look at? It is being addressed elsewhere. Um, and, and for me, what I would say is if someone's done their signs of safety training and they're, um, they've got a, de a degree in social work, I would expect them to do refresher training specific to the directorate, not necessarily uh, one size fits all. So it is something we need to look at, but I think that's a, a wider conversation. But am I going to worry about it at this point that my directorate is not meeting that standard? No, definitely not, because the standards that they are meeting are so impressive considering the demand that they have. Thank you. I think that's a fair comment. Um, right then, moving on, I did have a question at the bottom of 16, but it's basically a, um, a, a re, um re-going over what we've asked previously so I'm going to ignore uh, not ignore but just skip on from that um, the next one that I have is um, I've got Councillor Llewellyn Hopkins linked on her question on page 17 but I don't know if you want to come in on that or if you feel you've covered that Um, I think they've answered basically what I wanted to ask. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, no problem. Um, moving on then to page 18. Um, again, firstly, I want to welcome this because um, on the third paragraph down, I can see that we've got um, the number of young, uh, young people presented to EEP panel since June 2023 is 42. And then it goes on to disseminate that... Um, it was 18 females, 24 males from the age range of um, 8 to 17. The nature of the exploitation in these cases has included sexual exploitation, criminal exploitation, trafficking and periods of missing. Um, so we're looking at a much broader context in terms of the exploitation that we're looking at. And I, I think that is really good that we are breaking it down into that context and looking at the different sorts of exploitation because when you talk about exploitation instantly the general public just go oh child child sex exploitation or you know trafficking or it's good to see that this is actually being broken down into really specific sections because that i think helps us to focus um so i really like that and i, I just want to say that i, I do welcome that um, it's not it's not a, a criticism because it's the nature of what we're doing because this is new and this is a new way of working obviously we haven't got any figures to to look against but i will be interested to see as we go forward what those figures will will look like so but i just want to welcome that because i think that's a really good um move forward there so thank you for that um page 19 um i've got councillor Llewellyn hopkins coming in again about home education thank you Thank you, Chair. Um, there's sort of three parts to this question. So the first part is what are we doing to ensure the home edu educated children are actually educated? And following on from that, what safeguarding measures are in place for these children? And then the supplementary to that is what support as a council are we giving families that genuinely want to home educate their children? Thank you. Do you want to come in on this? Oh. <laughs> Gail, do you want to come in on this? Yeah, of course, yeah. So um, the first part, so ensuring there's a suitable education. Um, we had new guidance from Welsh Government in May this year in um, 
for elective home ed young people. There was some um, key elements of that guidance, um, which has changed from previous years, which involve um, sighting children. Previous guidance was making contact annually, um, making contact with families. We did not um, have to meet with them. Some families choose to share information about the education via telephone or email um, and chose not to accept a visit. The guidance this year, to, in order to establish this a suitable education um, happening within the home, includes ensuring officers who make that contact make contact with a young person and also um, ensure they have records of the voice of the child. So previously it would have been what the parent presented to us. Now it's essential we include and listen to what the child is telling us. Um, are they happy? How do they feel? What are their plans and wishes for the future? Because Elective home ed young people do not have to follow a curriculum as in school. They don't have to follow a timetable. They don't have to work the set hours. So in order to establish their accepting, um, they don't have to do any assessments either. They're receiving a suitable education. It's quite a challenging task. Um, so to have some uh, a little more clarity from um, Welsh Government now around how we can approach that. And that you know is really important. We have the voice of the child. And in, in, in establishing what their interests are and what they want to do in the future, we can then say, well, actually, what, you're, what you, you as a parent are providing won't meet that need. And we can look at ways of supporting the parent and directing them. One of the things we do um, to do that while I'm talking about future plans for young people is those who are coming to the end of what would be post statutory education when they're the they, 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 um, year 11 equivalents. Um, we've been using some of our Welsh Government funding for the last um, three years um, with a programme working alongside Bridgend College and we've done a transition programme around Easter time for all of our rising year 11s or, or traditional school leavers where they get an opportunity to go to college for around six weeks and do some um, taster programmes in different college courses um, and also um, get more used to being back in that classroom type environment, which, which some young people may not have experienced if they've always been elective home ed and others might have been out of for a long time. So that's one of the things we do to support and ensure the education is suitable and we're planning for their longer term future outside of statutory age groups. Could you just refresh me on the other two parts of the question, please? Right. Um, what safeguarding measures are in place for these children and what support are we giving to the families who genuinely want to home educate, please? Yeah. So safeguarding wise, um, the officer responsible for elective home ed visit um, works within the education engagement team. Education engagement team is also safeguarding the education team. So the officer responsible um, also works with schools, delivers all child protection training, uh, designated lead training, so is um, familiar with all the safeguarding processes. That officer also does the education, um, is on the education rotor to, to work within MASH once a week, so has close links with our, with our IAA team and can raise and discuss any concerns she has um, at the earliest point um, because she sits within that team as well. The change to guidance where we are looking for visits and meetings with parents. Now I say visits, it's it's um it's a change to the guidance where we need to visit and have that voice of the child. However, parents can um decide that they don't want to have a home visit, we can arrange visits off site and all of those things. So there are there, there is an intention that we will have eyes on and do a home visit where possible or meet with the family at some point at a minimum of every 12 months going forward, which is a significant improvement on previous years and the guidance provided from Welsh Government. And we hope that will help us to be able to safeguard and identify any potential issues at an earlier point um, within the process. And then the final part, we do have um, funding from Welsh Government to support our engagement with those families. And we use that funding in a variety of manners. Um, the first point, um, uh, the first part I've already covered on the transitional work um, and we work with families uh, with our year 11s in Bridgend College. 
Other areas where we support families um, include well-being and social interaction. So we have some activity days um, and provision that we provide which involve maybe forest schools. And we invite not only the elective home ed child, we invite the entire family along so parents can engage with that program as well. So we have activities through the year. So there might be forest schools engagement, wellbeing days. We have um, community groups where um, we set up a drop in centre and we invite families to come in and take advice around um, support in education. Um, any challenges they've had and just an opportunity to come in and discuss with officers that normally happens termly. Um, other examples we support with resources. Um, so particularly when families have decided to deregister from school in the early stages, we have resource packs and workbooks that we can help establish that first stage of working from home. So they could be revision packs, they could be um, literacy numeracy workbooks to get parents started along the line from teaching from home. We support with um, vouchers for them to purchase their own books as well. And um, most importantly, we also help fund exams and accreditations if parents make that application to us because it's really important we prepare them for the future going forward. Does that answer the question for you? Yes, thank you. That's quite reassuring to hear. Thanks. Yes, it is, isn't it? Um, Councillor Davis, can I bring you in? And uh, it looks like you're in the 1940s there. So uh, well, that, that's a picture of that's a picture of the old Coliseum which is Bankaya Square many years ago. Oh, so, lovely. Yeah, it's been knocked down a long time ago now. Yeah, but, uh, I used to dinner to school in that building um, many years ago. Um, thank you, for, thank you for the report. Um, as someone who did home educate his child for a very short period, uh, believe it or not. Um, and he went back to mainstream after that then, quite quickly after that, in between school sort of thing. That, um, we did it for a short period. It, I don't know if it's a question for this for this uh, committee. Is there any sort of, obviously, that you, you, you talk about social service, saying that they're the, you know, the safeguard inside the child, obviously, because you need to know that's the, the main thrust of this, is to make sure that the child's safe when his education is taking place. Is there any sort of follow-up to these children, you know, the ones that are, are, are home educated, uh, about the percentage of GCSEs they passed, you know, et cetera, and, you know, and in the future, do you know what I mean? Where rather than just here and now, how these children do sort of long, do we look into that as social services? or would you say education is? I'm not quite sure. Do you understand the question? It, how do they do later on in life then, you know, where is it a complete failure or are these kids, you know, superstars who go on to greater and greater things, you know, better and greater things? I think that's a pertinent question because obviously that falls under future well-being of the child as yeah, well. So, yeah, it's a few, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's you've right. got any stats on that, Gail, have you? Um, we don't. Um, uh, we we support up into up to statutory school age only. Um, obviously, we can monitor and ask for updates via um, those who attend the college course following our introduction there and outcomes from that. Um, we have data for those who go on from that transitional course onto full time courses, and that's been very successful in the past few years. Um, but I don't believe there's currently um, any data. Um, certainly there isn't for Bridgend. I don't believe that's being gathered nationally either, but it's something that is being talked about. Um, there are some challenges around that because of the, the nature of elective home ed. Um, we have some restrictions on sharing data for those families as well, and um, they're not allowed to be held on a register as 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 an entire, uh, you know, as in a school role in that manner. The data has to be on a child by child basis. So so it's a bit more complex around what, what families agree as well. So at the moment, unfortunately, we don't have that data. Thank you. Councillor Hughes. Yes. Sorry, does that answer your question, Councillor Davis? Sorry, I, I got I lost that for a second. Then my connectivity Sorry, went. That, that I, didn't the very, that. I think it does, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it did. Yeah, yeah. It was, just, it was a point I wanted to sort of make as well. You know that uh, there's not the monitoring going on is you know is quite limited, as you said. You know because because it's data sharing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. So it'd be nice to know if you, how these kids just generally how these kids do, wouldn't it? You know if they are being home educated. That's what I'd like to know. But it's difficult. It's difficult. There. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hughes. Hi there. I think uh, this has just raised something for me that, I, that I've never thought about before. And obviously there's a number of um, families who home educate their child. And for me, I'm just sort of, I think, quite alarmed that up until now, there hasn't been a need to do a visit. 
So I suppose my think, what I'm just thinking now is, OK, a parent refuses a visit and these visits are, are only yearly anyway. So um, irrespective of what qualifications these child go on to receive, I'm worried. I th I'm thinking about our most vulnerable child who, if they attend school regularly, somebody is, is seeing uh, changes in behaviour. They're picking up things about the child. So ultimately, a child is home educated, for example. Their parents don't particularly engage. So the only way, how is that child going to come to our attention? You know, would it just be somebody who lives locally who is concerned that they're not seeing the child out play? That sort of thing, really. I know it's very difficult, but that would be my greatest concern is those children may not be interactive, interacting with anybody. And then how do any safeguarding concerns come to us then, really? That's all. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I can I can uh, respond to that. So, so the process is we arrange the visit, we make contact. Obviously, if we find we have a reluctant parent or lack of engagement, um, our links with um, health and um, children's services become really important at this stage because a parent disengaging doesn't mean a child's at risk. They could be, you know, working really well and there are no concerns. However, we need to be reassured if nobody has seen that child for a long time. So our links with MASH are really important. Um, we've had examples of this in, in recent months where um, my officer has raised a concern that she hasn't seen, nobody's had any contact with, with children for a while, parents aren't responding. We can go into the MASH hub on the duty days and speak to our health colleagues to check if they've been attending any health appointments? Have they been seen by a GP recently? Have they had any health appointments at where they've attended? Now, if that flags up some no-shows there, then we're starting to put together a, a, a little puzzle that they might be a concern. If there has been attendance and things are going well at health appointments, then that also is a little reassuring. We can link in with our children's service colleagues. Have you had any referrals? Is there anything that is alert and any concerns? So we will use those contacts. Um, to start that process to reassure ourselves that everything is fine. If there isn't any engagement, then we haven't got any evidence this a suitable education um, uh, ongoing at home because we haven't actually had any contact with anybody. And that's when we can start the, um, the, the process um, laid out within the elective home ed guidance, and that involves statutory attendance orders and statute. So we can start sending out that letter and start the process. More often or not, the initial letter will trigger a contact from the parent um, for those who are working well with, with them and just haven't made the appointment. So, so the process is quite robust. Um, and again, working really well with our colleagues provides us that information. Thank you. Councillor Davis, I'm going to bring you back in very, very briefly, please. Very briefly, Chair. Just when we took uh, Philip out briefly from the school, we was advised about um, social isolation, which is sort of where Dale is coming from, not just the, the safeguarding side of it. They can be affected, you know, um, by not mixing with their peers, et cetera, you know, and they get, become isolated in that way. So that was that's the another thing you need. To, there's our groups out there where they can go almost like school, ironically, where they can go and be, you know, sort of mix with other kids, basically, to keep that going, you know, because you don't want them sat in the house on their own forever do you know what I mean that's not a good thing either thank you thank you no you're quite right and thank you for those answers Gales I think uh Gales Gail sorry <laughs> I'm pluralizing you um no I think they they've covered it um you've covered it well there because uh, there are a number of concerns about safeguarding there and I think um it's something that really we need to keep on top of there because it can be such a a, a red flag issue there that um children might get missed on that on in that regard you know because they are they haven't got those eyes on them daily so um thank you for those answers moving on um page 19 um again going through to page 20 um first of all i just wanted to um i, I just want to going through on to page 20 i just want to thank um and note that extra support is in place and I think that's really good on the second paragraph there's um, recruitment of a, a dedicated older person's IDVA and um, a male victim IDVA I think that's fantastic I think that's a real progress forward because again as before where we're splitting down the um, exploitation categories I think that's really really good to have these extra um, roles put in place there However, that said, going back to page 19, 
On the table eight, um, I do notice again that we don't have any comparison figures. Um, so it's quite difficult to look at these figures in isolation. So I think maybe going forward, if we could you know, perhaps have those, that would be fantastic. Um, uh, carrying on to page 21, if nobody else has anything. Um, I did what now Councillor Maxine Lewis, unfortunately, is having IT issues. And um, this is the second meeting, unfortunately, where she can't talk in the meeting because the microphone's not working. So um, I know Councillor Lewis obviously has a real interest in the area that is discussed in the middle of the page here about antisocial behaviour in my stake and the town centres and um, the um, uh, work that's been done to uh, eradicate that uh, behaviours. So I know that she would want to welcome that um, and uh, obviously note that because it's good work that's happening there again. And I think it's always heartening to, to see good work. So although she can't um, speak up at the moment, so to speak, um, I do know that she does want to, to welcome that as well. So, Councillor Davis, can I bring you in as one of the local members as well, please? Yeah, again, briefly, Chair, um, regarding antisocial behaviour, ironically, we had a meeting in my state town council last night and the police gave us figures of, um, and they were dramatically reduced in the, in the Clinbury Valley area. So that confirms what you just uh, sort of said, basically, that the, with the work being done, you know. Because we've had some terrible trouble up here with, you know, over the years with antisocial behaviour. But there's mm. been some marked improvement lately, apparently. I think it, it blights a lot of communities does antisocial behaviour because it comes in so many different formats. So it's good to hear that actually it's being um, not just challenged but eradicated because that's a, a major step forward because it does affect the welfare of so many people. Um, you know, a lot of people and it's usually just one or two people that are causing the problems. So, no, that's good to hear. So thank you for that. Moving on again. Um, page 22, um, I don't know if anybody else has anything on page 22 members, but I just wanted to raise the fact um, again under housing, please. We've got there a figure for 280 children are placed in temporary accommodation and we kind of have touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, I just wondered what the impact were on um, safeguarding for these children, what the um, impact is for their well-being overall, because obviously some of these accommodations really are um, quite unsuitable, not unsuitable, but quite, um, uh, I don't really know how to say it, you know, they're quite brutal, some of them, they're, they're, they're not a, a child-friendly environment. Mm -hmm. So um, I just wondered how we were assessing the impact on these children and um, what we were doing to ensure that, you know, it wasn't having a further knock-on effect in, say, education and things like that for these children. Thank you. Oh. Councillor Gebby, I'm going to bring you in, but then can I bring Martin Morgans in, please? Yes, thank you. Thanks, Chair, and thanks for the question. I think one of the things I would refer you to is our Corporate Parenting Board, and it's a piece of work that we've picked up as we've identified it as an issue. We don't think any of our care-experienced children should be reporting as homeless. We think that measures should be taken. And I'm sure Martin's going to make some contributions around that now. But we wouldn't allow it for our own children leaving home. Uh, we would find somewhere for them to go. It might be a flat or it might be supported accommodation. It might even be halls of residence. But we would move our children on. And, and that would be quite right and proper as well, because they're becoming adults and they are young adults. But I don't think any one of them should be leaving one of our foster care and arrangements or even one of our uh, placements and reporting as homeless. I think all of this should be organised in advance. So it is a piece of work that we are aware of. As to the effect, it can have a significant effect on a young person not knowing where they're going to live from one minute to the next. I think that's really destructive to them. Um, so it's something that we are keen on and we are doing a, a piece of work around it now. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, sorry, just before I bring you in, Martin, because the, the figures here say including 208 children placed into temporary accommodation. Not all of those are care looked after, are they? So, right, yes, just for clarity there. Thank you. Um, Martin, can I bring you in, please? 
That, thank you, Chair. Marley Moore's Head of Partnership Services. So in terms of those figures there, that, that, that's dealing specifically with people who present as homeless in terms of the, the housing team and we put into temporary accommodation. We, we predominantly go through a, a review and a, an application assessment in terms of, of those households. Um, where children are involved, we tend to find that we utilise um, the private rental sector or, and or Airbnb. So we try and keep the family together from that in, from that implication. We uh, currently where we sit in the moment, we have around about um, just under 300 uh, households in temporary accommodation, which equates to about 550 people. 15% of those will be family orientated uh, sort of um, environments but you know obviously our trained officers will be identified for any issues and flag up with the necessary teams in terms of from a safeguarding perspective but we we try where possible um chair to ensure the accommodation is is fit for purpose for those families albeit the, the challenging with schools etc in terms of the shortfall of uh, the pr the private rental sector it's difficulty to place um, families in the right areas but that's, that's something we 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 look at as one of those key drivers in terms of facilitating that uh, temporary accommodation and then we use the rapid rehousing uh, protocol in terms of moving these families on into more sustained tenancy so it's it's really challenging at the moment as a number of reports have taken into scrutinies and to members where we are in terms of the lack of housing stock available but and, and where we find ourselves but you know where possible we we try and house families in the right right type, type accommodation within their supported network but it, it is Pretty, pretty difficult, but that that's specifically the the outline in that paragraph is about people presenting in terms of homeless and with regards um, presentations. But you know, just to echo Councillor Council, uh, Bees, the deputy's words that we're working closely with social services in terms of next step on move on for our, our care experience children and something as part of our SHAP process. When when our housing support strategy is endorsed, we'll be looking at that in terms of supporting those young people as well, where they move on accommodation. So. But very challenging, I have to say, Chair, in terms of where we are uh, in terms of a housing position. But I, I'm, I take on board the, the note and, and we'll provide the, the sort of uh, evidence of the previous statistics in, in going forward for the next report and for both the vows as well. So taking that on board, thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, just coming back on, on what you've said there as well, because I know that you've mentioned about the PRS, the private rental sector, um, and I know that some um, local authorities do work with um, partner organisations such as the NRLA, who um, they represent um, uh, developers and um, homeowners in the private rental sector. Um, so I just wondered if we were engaging with the sort of partner organisations like the NRLA and, and things like that, and if so, who are we um, partnering with and, and discussing how we can work effectively with them? In terms of, oh, we're obviously not a stockholding authority, um, which which makes it a bit difficult in terms of pr private rental. Uh, but the cabinet just endorsed and supported the new Welsh government uh, uh, private rental scheme, which allows us to take on private rented accommodation. We will support it lock, stock, and barrel in terms of tenancy and maintenance. And and it's something now we're trying to drive forward. Once we've secured that, we'll be engaging with those partner organisations where we can engage with our PRS in terms of adding our, our numbers of uh, accommodation units. We, we work closely um, on an alternative bed and breakfast scheme, which has seen our accommodation units go from 2019-12 units, we're up to about, around about circa 60 units, where uh, third sector providers providing that, that uh, management uh, for the, those units is predominantly fed in from our registered social landlord sector. But this is where the private rental sort of uh, agreement we will be setting up now and endorse when the money comes in early January it will allow us then to engage with the PRS and private landlords, as you said, in terms of adding those units into that scheme where the authority will take management. So I'm looking forward to the new year. We can start doing that engagement and, and, and get the numbers up once from the, with regards to our scheme. So, yeah, we will be engaging with the likes of the, the partners organisation just mentioned. I think that's really to be welcomed, isn't it? And it's um, it's really not a month too soon, is that? Because uh, I think that will relieve an awful lot of pressures for us as a um, an authority as well, won't it, going forward, hopefully. So, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think the challenge we'll have is the local housing allowance and, you know, and there's something we're pushing back in terms of Welsh government, the differential between the, the, the private rental sector value proposition versus a local housing allowance. So something 
I know all authorities and uh, members are lobbying Welsh Government. We need to get that raised really to, to support people wanting to support the social sector via the, the private rental. So it's uh, it's something we lobby in, but I'm, I'm hoping the scheme with numbers is going to improve out opportunity to reduce our temporary accommodation uh, threshold we've got at the moment. Yeah, no, thank you very much for that answer. That's uh, um, uh, a very full answer. So thank you very much, Martin. That's appreciated. Um, moving forward, if there's no more questions on page 16, page um, sorry, page 22, I meant not 16, page 23, um, Councillor Llewellyn Hopkins, I think I've got you coming in at, uh, at the top there, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, Appendix one on page 23. Um, states that the placements out of Bridgemba in Wales are 88 and placements outside Wales 15. I wanted to know, please, what's the safeguarding and the budgetary implications of these placements, please? Uh, th thank you for the question, um, Councillor Llewellyn Hopkins. Um, I think in terms of, of the placements outside of, of, of Bridgend, um, placements outside of Wales, sometimes there will be safeguarding reasons that the placement is, is outside of, of the local authority area. Um, it might be that it's a connected um, family member who lives outside of the, the area and the child is, is care experienced but is, is living with um, a connected person. It might be that there's a specialist foster placement or um, residential care home which doesn't exist within the county borough um, that means that the, the child is, is accommodated for a period of time outside of the county borough. Sometimes the child is accommodated outside of the county borough because there isn't sufficient um, accommodation, care and support within. There wouldn't necessarily be any safeguarding implications from, from that, um, but there certainly may be budgetary um, implications because if this is an independent foster agency carer um, or an independent residential home, those um, provisions are more expensive um, considerably than our in-house provision. You know, the vast majority of our Bridgend foster carers, um, not all, but the vast majority um, are based in Bridgend. Um, and obviously our in-house residential care home provision is in Bridgend as well. So it is, as a general room, more, more, more expensive, um, but it may be the best way to, to safeguard some of those children, not all. Thank you. Councillor Gebby. And I think the only additional comment I would make is sometimes that's best for the child. You know, it, it's it's really simple answer that. And also that oversight still remains with Bridgend Social Services. So their social worker would still remain in Bridgend and it would be up to them to meet all statutory requirements in that regard. So we always have oversight. So I'm not overly concerned about safeguarding arrangements because it's the same safeguarding that we've discussed all throughout this report. Thanks very much, Chair. Thank you. Does that uh, um, answer your question there, Councillor Llewellyn Hopkins? Yes, thank you. Lovely, thank you. Um, going forward, any other questions on page 23, please? Any other questions on page 24? Lovely, thank you very much. Right then. Um, I think what I will do is call a five minute recess if everyone's OK with that, um, just because um, it's taken a little longer than I anticipated. So if everybody could be back for uh, 35 minutes past, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>